This is the second studio hosted by the Architecture and Design Office fame. My name is David Lee, and with me is Marina Bordero. This week it's the two of us, and we are going to have a conversation about program in architecture. What does program mean? That sounds ultra boring, doesn't Why it? Why <laughs> it's not boring? Why it's incredibly important? How we leverage program in, in our office and how we work to create great designs? Um, how we generate the program list? What it is? All of that good stuff. Yeah, it's actually more exciting than than you think it might be. So, um... if you don't think it's exciting, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsors. We are supported by Enscape. Enscape is a real time visualization and VR tool that we personally use and recommend. Now, why do we like it? Well, it's fast and realistic, but it's also really easy to use. The interface is great. It has a strong library of components, and it renders in real time, which means we don't have to waste time waiting for the image to be rendered to see what it will look like. It's also a plugin that works with all of the major 3D modelers, and it's available for Mac and PC. So if you want to up your visualization and rendering game, then definitely check out Enscape by clicking the Enscape 3D link in our show notes. Are you interested in a computer program that combines construction drawings and 3D models? modeling in one software and in one model? If so, then you should check out the BIM program ARCHICAD. ARCHICAD leads the industry by enabling architectural and interdesign firms around the world to freely design supported by innovative technology that expands as far as the imagination can stretch. Check it out by clicking on the ARCHICAD link in our show notes. This is the second studio with myself and Marina. Here we go. So program and architecture in the broadest sense means the comprehensive list of requirements that the project must meet, right? And the project means, yes, the architecture of the building, also the interior design, and also the property master planning and design itself. And the requirements, are, again, are comprehensive. So we're talking about the functional requirements, we're talking about the activities that take place in the building and on the property, and we're also talking about any technological requirements. So all the requirements you need to have that building work, that's what the program is. I think what's interesting is that when we talk about program for single family houses, there tends to be this um, assumption or misconception that it just means the list of rooms, right? Right. So like in real estate, when, when folks often talk about the program of a house, they say, oh yeah, it's three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a living room, a kitchen. Um, maybe there's like a game room space and there's a backyard with a pool and that's the program of the house. And uh, to me, that's, a very generic list. It's also not a very, so it's not comprehensive enough. It's also not very detailed enough to design off of. That information is not detailed enough. You mean it's not specific enough? It's not specific enough. So as an example, if we were to design an office workplace, right? Uh, so let's say you were a business owner, you came to me and you said, I want to design this office or have you design this office for me. The program list would be very detailed and thorough. So we would say, um, we need 50 workstations for 50, or let's say 35 employees, and I plan on growing a little bit, so I want 50, in fact. Um, the workstations have to have certain technological requirements, so fast internet for everybody, phone line connections, the desks need to be large enough to hold two monitors, spaces for drawings if you're an architecture office, um, and we didn't have good daylight for everybody. The program list would also be, let's say, five con conference rooms, one boardroom, maybe a couple closed door private offices for the senior partners or the HR. We need a reception area with waiting that needs to be a certain size, well, waiting area with a certain size, uh, a certain number of bathrooms, a kitchen, a print and copy room, a server room. So like everything that you would possibly need for that office to function at a high level is on that list. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and it gets quite detailed, right? When we talk about the workstations, maybe we need X number of workstations that have desks that raise and lower, or some that are accessible, uh, you know, ADA compliant, all of these things. So I think anyone who's listening to this who's worked in an office, like you can visualize, yeah, that makes sense for an office. So you would need a very, again, comprehensive understanding of, of all the requirements for someone to design with. And yet, for some reason, I think commonly in residential design, there's not that level of interrogation or thoughtfulness that happens. We tend to not we, but there tends to be kind of a glossing over it, right? Like, yeah, just give me three bedrooms and two bathrooms, and what else do you need to know? Let's 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 go. But the the the, the office example is interesting because to me it's still a very superficial and, and anonymous in a way. It's not really specific to the the, the actual um, company you're designing it for. Like, it's still a very baseline, prescriptive way of providing information to a project. 
uh, you know, like the list of services you mentioned, that sounds like it could it could be to me for any company. Sure. It's not specific to one company. So, you know, I think the interesting question with program is like this prescriptive list is interesting to have and necessary to have, but it should open up to um, cater more toward the uniqueness of who it is for. Okay. Right. So if you're designing an office uh, and you are a very different business from the one that's next door, how could the program requirements could enhance the office to be distinctive and not just be about the number of rooms, but maybe more about the office culture that you're trying to develop or like what is your brand and how can the design of the space enhance that brand? Right? Yeah. So I think that's true. I think um, the brand, it's an interesting subject and idea because so the the program as i mentioned is the functional a aspects of the project the activities and the technology it is most often not the aesthetics part of the project yeah. it's not like materials and, yeah. and, no, not. and colors and stuff like that there are kind of exceptions to that rule one would be the brand in terms of an office if my uh this imaginary company the color blue a very specific blue is a part of the brand's identity, then that becomes a part of the program because it's one of the requirements. Like we need the the, the lobby space to have our brand colors laced within it somehow, right? That's an aesthetic thing, but it's tied to one of the requirements. The same way, if we look at a single family house, right? Program is not um, the selection of the kitchen countertop materials, usually. But there could be very specific design features or items or things that need to be incorporated that do have a very strong aesthetic and visual uh, character and presence. For example, a large piece of artwork or a small piece of artwork that has significance to the client that must be displayed. Well, that's part of the program. Or a client that has, um, I'm thinking about one, who had an extensive black and white photography collection that was dispersed throughout the house. Like that is part of program that we need to know about from the very beginning. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And I totally agree with that. Um, what I meant with like the brand of an office, I didn't really mean in terms of like graphics and logos and colors, but more into maybe descriptive adjectives of what you want the space to feel like. Like you're designing a, a, an Etsy office while well, maybe you want a maker space and you want, you want collective common spaces to be more inclusive into exchange and uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not specific as to how many desks and whether the desks need to be by a window or in a dark corner. It's more like, I want to achieve this. I don't know how, but I know that I want this space to enhance and, and emphasize on those types of interaction. Yeah, and that brings about the question of how we determine the the program yeah. uh, list, which we're, we'll talk about I do want to, like, so one question we should address, which is, when does this program list happen? When was, do we develop yeah, it? Yeah, that was right? my question. Like, if I'm a client about to do a residential project, do I have to come to an architect with my program list? Or do I create that list with the architect? Like, how does it work? It's a good question. It's a little bit of both. When it gets developed, it starts at the very beginning. Because it's the foundations of the project, as I said earlier, I think. So um, in a lot of cases, the clients for houses or for offices, for everything else, right? Everyone likes to zoom forward and talk about very specific, oftentimes aesthetic choices um, that have nothing to do with brand that, that I mentioned earlier. Like if it's a house, oh, I want these types of windows. I want to have that color. I want to have this material. And that's totally fine. Everyone has their wish list of things for sure. But... Uh, for an architect or designer, that's oftentimes not where we start. Those decisions are made much further down the line, and actually the program is what we start with. So again, as I said, when it's the foundation, I really meant that. So the first conversations we have with the client is about developing that program mm -hmm. list, and only after we've developed it, or 90% of it, then do we actually start drawing. We don't start drawing anything until I have an understanding of all the requirements. And that well, makes total sense, That right? makes sense because otherwise you're just kind of like starting on the um, on the assumption that that program has been validated. Yeah, and you don't know. Rather than maybe he just came from Zillow because that's the only thing people know about program. And exactly. they've never questioned it or thought about it or sat down and be like, what, I, what do I want it to be? Right? And, that, and that's a distinction as well, right? That's what we're saying is that the program that is thought about when people 
embark on a residential project or think about houses tends to be that Zillow list you mentioned, mm -hmm. which is like three bullet points or five bullet points of typical rooms, and then that's the program. So to answer your question of how does the program list get developed, um, most clients will come to us or come to an architect already having idea an idea of, of uh, um, the starting point of the program. And usually it's, oftentimes it's close to the Zillow list. And our job, I believe, is to help them through conversation develop it much further than that. Much, much further than that. So there's two aspects to that. One, we want that list to be much more comprehensive than the generic list because a generic program will produce a generic architecture um, and a generic way of living. And in addition to having a more exhaustive list, we want to have a much more in-depth and detailed understanding of each of those spaces and how they're used. I mean, if you look back at the example of offices, right, mm -hmm. if you kind of like look at that generic list of requirement, program requirements for offices, and you think about what that office looks like, we've all seen them, right? There are all of those TI projects that or they're kind of like soulless, faceless entity. Like the people in it and the business could be swapped the next day with another one. You will have no idea, right? Yeah. This is the ones that, I mean, maybe it's on an extreme scenario, but like the startup, like the, the Google, the Netflix, the Etsy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, those are very specific to those industries and those companies. Mm -hmm. And if you were to swap the people in it and the and the and the the firm that's in it with another one, it probably wouldn't suit them. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. And that's where also, as I said at the beginning, that the program is one of the most important aspects of architecture, but it could often be uh, falsely a boring part of architecture. And only, it's only boring if, if you don't analyze don't it, it properly. So yeah. there's a certain sort of, not sort of, there's a creativity to developing a program list because that's actually where the seeds of the most interesting design decisions come from, is the program. And as I said before, it occurs through conversation. So really, when it comes to houses, we're trying to understand how people live. So what do we do when we work with the client? We basically, we have a conversation. Some of, some of the questions we like to ask are, uh, one of them is, just describe to me your daily routine, your daily rituals and routine during the weekdays and the weekends, because usually the weekdays and weekends are a little bit different. And take us through, you know, what time do you wake up? What happens when you wake up? Do you eat breakfast? Do you not eat breakfast? Like in great detail, let's go through the story of your life on a, on a daily basis. Um, and the other question we like to ask also is, what is a person's at-home hobbies? Because it tends to be, I think it's very easy for people who you know are working to just gloss over their hobbies and not think that they're important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But everyone has some kind of hobbies usually. Is it reading? Do you like reading in the daylight? Is it playing games? with? Like, What are your hobbies that take place at home, in the property, out in the yard? And also, I like to ask, like, what are people's hobbies outside of the property, just so I understand them as people better? Is like hiking your main hobby? Is it bowling? Is it gaming? You know, what, what takes place outside of the, the house? It's interesting because, yeah, it sounds like it's not really the, like, the, the most of the time... Uh, type of use and program that happens and therefore it's not that important because I'm not going to be reading 90% of my time in this house so why you know would the house be focusing on that mm -hmm. but in the same time those small moments that make you different from the next door neighbor because of your personal interest and what you do if those uh, bring you joy and pleasure in the in the weekends you know maybe there is a way to implement it so it doesn't only happen just on the weekends. Maybe it can happen throughout the week. Maybe it could bring you even more joy because it's been actually, you know, carefully crafted and set in your house to take a, a more important place than what it was before. Yeah. And what's really fascinating is that through these conversations, sometimes it's one, but oftentimes it takes time to get to know someone. Um, we start to, like I used the word archaeological earlier, it's sort of like that because you're unearthing interesting things about a human being and you're slowly starting to realize the activities and things they do which are important and they do on a regular basis but they just don't recognize it yeah. so when we're developing the, the the program list it's not just about knowing all the stuff they do it's about finding the hierarchy right which things actually have immense value to them and that value could be because they spend a lot of time doing it or it could be that they don't spend a lot of time doing it, but it has an, an emotional impact 
and, and an emotional value that's very important to their mental health or whatever it might be. And so we're trying to unearth, right, and understand all of these things. And it's not uncommon for in those conversations the clients to realize like, oh, I've, I do this thing every day. Actually, I enjoy it a lot and I do this thing, but I don't really have a space for it. I like to have a space for it. So one of the examples that comes to mind is, you know, a client, um, again, the first meeting, what, what, uh, what's going into this house? Number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, kitchen. I want the kitchen to face like I have a window, like kind of generic stuff. And we're talking and we're talking and we ask about hobbies. Oh, I do pottery. Oh, that's interesting. Do you do pottery at a studio? You know, do you go somewhere? Oh, no, I do pottery at home. Really? Okay. Do you have any photos of it? Well, these are actually really nice objects. How often do you do it? I do it very, very often. And, you know, I'm not an artist, but I do like little gallery showings and I sell them and, and whatever. And I, and I do this thing. Okay. Well, pottery now becomes a very important part of the program. And it turns out a very important part of that person's life that was, again, kind of subconsciously there. And uh, so what happened in that is that originally the house was kind of conceived without a space for pottery because it wasn't thought about. Yeah. Um, and then when we engaged with them and we brought up these questions, we said, well, we should have a space for this then. And so then we started to ask, like, what would be the requirements for a pottery studio in the house? Good daylight, enough space, this and that, whatever. And it turns out also that they have people over and sometimes the people come over, they also like to look at what they've been working on and this kind of stuff. So we said, okay, the, the pottery studio before studio was basically just a, it was a garage where you took over part of the garage. You had this corner where you're doing stuff, not good daylight, all these problems. How about in the new house, we put the pottery studio more central. So it's a dignified space. Let's have it face an interior uh, courtyard to get plenty of daylight. Having an interior courtyard in house is also really cool. And let's have one, or I think it was two sides of this pottery studio be floor to ceiling glass. So lots of daylight, but also means that when you have people over, people get to see the things you're working on. It becomes sort of like a, uh, almost like a miniature in progress gallery that's going on. And that as a sent, and that kicked off, that led to a bunch of other design decisions that were really interesting. That would have never happened if we didn't bother to have a conversation to understand how a person, their, their hobbies and what their interests are and how they actually live. The space that was not even on the list uh, but was used in the corner of a garage now becomes a central component to the house that in that case makes a lot of sense. Not, not all hobbies deserve a space in the house like that, but in that case it made sense. Yeah, no, I think it does. And again, it, it you know, like once that pottery studio will be done, that client will probably be able to focus more and maybe even be more like way more productive in what they're creating, which is, I think, the ultimate effect of a great space on somebody. Um, you know, sometimes we have also clients who they want a gym, um, you know, and it's either like they have their ritual you know, workout and they have a morning routine, an evening routine, sometimes a daytime routine. Mm -hmm. And it's very different if they're just like doing it like, you know, half an hour every day or if they're doing like three hours a day, they bring on like a private coach or maybe they want it to be open to guests who are staying with them. So it's yeah. a kind of a shared space or maybe they have their friends coming over and they do classes together. Like it's like there is a million ways you can approach any space depending on how anyone, you know, intends on using it and, yeah. and and use it for. I think, I guess in a way, you could describe the approach as being a bit more scientific, you know, because the information we're looking for, again, is, is detailed and it's, it's kind of quantifiable. And it's just, it's an interesting thing that when we get to certain spaces, there's this idea that we can just gloss over them because we all know what's going to happen in a backyard. And it's like, but no, we don't. No, <laughs> but no, but we it, don't, but, right? But, Do you, like, but it's like watching a movie. Like, you, mm -hmm. can, you can have an horror movie being one way you can have it like a million different ways right like there is a there is a, a million way you can create a, a gym space or a pottery studio or a living room or a kitchen mm -hmm. i mean if you if you actually think about it as like a movie that like you're designing like the possibilities are endless i agree another question that we like to ask is whether or not people have uh, the clients have people over visiting whether or not they host gatherings and again, I think it's a good example of you could easily ask that question, like, do you have folks over visit your house? Yes. Okay, great. 
Uh, where do you gather? The kitchen. Okay, good. And then that's that's it. We're done with that conversation. Or how long are they But, staying? They're staying one night. They're staying two months. You know exactly. Like But the conversation goes further. So in addition to asking whether or not they have people over and whether or not they gather in the kitchen, which everyone does, we also ask, okay, who's coming over? Like I don't even know their names, but like, what are their relationships, right? Um, how long are they staying? And what is the nature of what? What things do you do when you're there? And what's the nature of of the gathering, right? So, not all gatherings are the same. Having, let's say, close just your close family over that you host them once a week because they live nearby and you guys cook dinner together, that's one very specific thing. That's different from yeah, I have my musician friends come over and we have jam sessions. Okay, that's also different. Versus, I'm an important business person. And I host a lot of business events at my house, so I have important work colleagues coming over for cocktails and things, and it's catered. Well, that's also extremely different from informal game night with your close family who lives down the street. And the numbers might be different too, right? You could be hosting 50 people if it's a kind of event like that, or maybe you like hosting giant house parties or something. So, getting an understanding of all these things, like it, it makes an incredible difference when we're going to design. And that's where I think,、um, you know, really the program can become a, a design tool. Yeah. Rather than just、uh, just constraints, you、yep. know, by being prescriptive, you're you're constraining the the possibilities, right? Like、mm -hmm. this is what I need, therefore I'm excluding everything else beyond that list.、Mm -hmm. But if you think about the way we've been describing it, which is much more like I'm just feeding you a lot of different spices to make your sauce here, <laughs> and it's just a matter of like.、Oh, What sauce are you going to make? We don't know, but we know. Oh, you mean that、spices. we're getting the spices and we're going to we're create something the sauce. with them?、Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th I think that's true. And this gets to so after we have the list of program, and as and sometimes we don't develop the full list from like day one because again it takes time to get to know somebody. So things evolve over time. But let's say we've established a list that we're pretty confident is a good starting point. What happens after that? I think one of the very common mistakes I see. Um, in young designers, for example, or let's say architecture students, or in bad architecture projects, is you just take that list and you just shove it into the project, and you throw on top of it an aesthetic, and you're、right. you're kind of done. And that's a a checklist way of designing. Like you need a bathroom that's this dimensions and this amount、it's、of countertop. It's an AI way of designing. <laughs> exactly. So you just stick it in, and you like modern stuff. So okay, fine. We don't have trim, and you like white, so it's all white. And yeah, we're done. And that leads to a very bad design.、Um, so there is a, a a creative aspect to how you implement program into a project, and the pottery was not not a bad example.、Um, so there is, in addition to having a detailed understanding of the program, there is an interrogation of it, and how we insert the program into the property. In a particular way, so that relates to the other program around it. So now we're talking about program adjacencies, flow, yeah,、uh, circulation, which is flow, views, daylight. All of these things start to be thrown into the mix. And I think that's where the、uh, Zillow way of designing a program and therefore designing buildings fail. Yep, is that. Basically, those boxes that you're checking on the list are ending up being boxes in real life,、yep. and completely ignore the relationship between the spaces and and around those spaces, which is really when design starts to emerge, and that's what architecture is about. Yeah, we're trying to find synergy between the ingredients, as、yeah. you put it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not, I'm not I don't really cook, so I can't come up with a great analogy. But it's sort of like you have a list of ingredients, and you just decide I'm going to take one tablespoon of all the ingredients and just throw it into a bucket. Or like you go to get an omakase, you know, like sushi, right?、Yeah. There is certain things you eat in a certain order、yep. because your palate would retain some of the previous flavors and would get prepared for the next ones to come. Or you have to cleanse between the two to really fully enjoy the last one. It's kind of it's what architecture is. Yeah, you know? yeah. Instead of a buffet. Style, just have anything in whatever well, order. Well, that's the thing. Zero is the buffet style. <laughs> yeah, kind of. You can have dessert with... to start, but、yeah. you might throw up halfway through. So. <laughs>
And now a little break for our show sponsors. Stop juggling multiple pieces of software and struggling with design-unfriendly spreadsheets. Programma, built by designers for designers, provides an integrated suite of tools for every phase of your project, from mood boards to advanced specification tools, procurement tracking to project management. Seamlessly integrated, easily shareable, and always current, Programma reduces redundancy and minimizes costly error. Join interior design movers and shakers by starting for free at programma.design slash second studio. Experience the difference with Programma, software built for interior design workflows. The Second Studio podcast is made possible by support from Autodesk. Autodesk has been part of the design conversation since 1982, providing the tools that help architects around the globe imagine and create beautifully designed, memorable buildings that people love and admire. Autodesk supports the work of the Second Studio, bringing the architecture community together, sparking curiosity, and leading vibrant interviews with the industry's visionaries and thought leaders. The Second Studio works hard to carry the architecture conversation forward, and Autodesk is proud to contribute to this podcast. You can learn more about Autodesk by clicking the link in the show notes. So um, once you have that list mm. that's kind of like established, you know, after like, those few conversation, then what happens? Yeah, so so we didn't really answer the question, I guess. So um, it depends. For some projects, uh, the the first drawing that we'll start with, and this varies on the project as well, but off, sometimes it's a floor plan, like an actual floor plan with wall thicknesses, doors and windows and all that kind of stuff. Other times, though, especially for larger projects, um, we, it, it'll be a plan view drawing, but it won't be a floor plan. It'll It'll be what we call a program diagram. So the program diagram has a bunch of different colors, and each color represents a certain type of program, um, and it'll be kind of a bubble shape. Maybe we'll show an example on here. So it's not a floor plan in the sense we're not getting so detailed in terms of like, how wide is this door and where is this door located? It's it's just understanding of relationships between these blob spaces. And the different colors can mean different things. Um, sometimes we use um, colors to indicate uh, kind of private program versus more public program. So in a house, bedrooms are private. The bathrooms for those bedrooms are private. Um, laundry spaces could be considered private. Um, living rooms and kitchens are obviously more public spaces. And that's to kind of, again, it, again we don't have a floor plan yet, but it's, it's again to test to see to whether or not this, this dispersal of program makes sense. Because we don't want to put things where they don't make sense. Well, and, and looking at that in conjunction to what is next to it and how does that relate to the exterior spaces as well? That's a big one, especially in California. So I was thinking of a project where, again, we started off with a very generic list of program. We realized that the one of the clients, uh, one of the partners does crafts, right? And there's a craft room. The existing craft room was not good, so we're going to create a new craft room. And we had, I think I'll put it in the video, but we had... Um, this uh, this kind of corner space in the house that faced the backyard. It's a really nice backyard. And the initial thought that they had was that they were going to put a guest bedroom there, right? And the more that we looked at it, we our proposal was, let's not do that. Let's put the guest bedroom on the other side of the house because the backyard is a main gathering space. It's like half an acre. It's pretty decent, right? And it's going to be landscaped beautifully and all those things. And you have gatherings and stuff. And the problem with putting a guest bedroom in that corner is that now when you're hosting and people come over, you have this adjacency problem, this yeah. conflict between someone who wants to retire early because maybe they traveled or whatever, and they want to have a nice little outdoor space at the end, end of the night. They can't have that because they're in the backyard. Well, we could put walls around to create a little outdoor space for them. Okay, but now you're closing off the house with the backyard. So we flipped it. We'll say, let's put the guest bedroom on the other side of the house. Let's take that space and make that the craft room because this is a house where you're going to retire soon and you're going to be doing more and more crafts. We're facing where there's great sunlight. Let's make it all glass or a lot of glass. And let's make it, let's have the doors so they, the doors open up because these folks like to be outside as well. Have the doors open up so you can put your craft table inside, outside, and, and work that way. And uh, it solved that decision to locate, pro, to swap program around made a very big difference. And uh, continuing with that example, we we asked them, what kind of crafts do you do? Turns out they make small leather goods. And so we said, well, what would be really cool is let's have you make some of the hand door handles and, and millwork handles for the project. So you actually get to make leather pieces that will go into the project. That has nothing to do with program necessarily, but it's, an ex again, an example of like when you start to 
peel the onion understand someone, you can do really cool things like that. And I think also from a client experience point of view during those design phases is that if there are creatives and in this case they are making things, like how can we how can we showcase that? How can we enhance that? How can we give them an opportunity to participate in the design of their own homes, mm. right? Uh, not by having them like draw floor plans, but by engaging them in a way that they feel like they've they've been a part of it, you yeah. know? Yeah. I think there's also more um, in, in bigger ways, there's, there's, there, there, there's, it's possible to have program be creative. So I was thinking, I was trying to think of another project. One was a house on a hillside and the clients loved being in the backyard. That's the benefit of being in California. Everyone can be outside all the time. They love being in the backyard, but they also loved the view that the hillside property gave them. But the house would block the view if you're in the backyard. And so one idea was to let's have part of the house extend and bury into the hillside and have the top of that roof be a green roof. So what happens is that the natural landscape actually extends on top of the roof. So now you can be in your backyard, but in fact, actually you're on top of the roof and you're getting a view toward, I think it was facing west, toward whatever cityscape, whatever thing it was, because we've done this move of taking taking part of the house and extending it into the hill so you can occupy on top of it. So in a very diagrammatic sense, it's not just about publicness and privateness and kind of common sense. You can find ways architecturally to merge stuff, unmerge stuff, incorporate different unique program to produce results that are more special, yes, but oftentimes there's an element of kind of efficiency, design efficiency, because you're sort of solving yeah, like three problems at once, once with yeah. one gesture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where I think that's where really like, again, design comes into play. Because if you approach it with the zero mindset, there are just like two boxes next to each other. Mm -hmm. But being creative enough to combining these two boxes into one that is seamless and provide to the highest level, you know, the use and the functionality and everything else that you want each of these spaces to create. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, yeah, this is design. This is completely unrelated to single family houses that, that we do, but there was um, uh, a design I had done when I was a student that was for a homeless shelter. So this was not built. This was like, you know, quite some time ago. Um, but there was an aspect of it that I always thought was, was interesting, which is, of course I did it. So I think it's interesting, but um, part of the program on paper called for having outdoor space for the homeless shelter. And there's a lot of ways you can create outdoor space. And I remember I had this thought of like, well, I'll create an outdoor space that feels sort of like a courtyard um, that opens up to one side. This is like a river body of water thing or whatever. I'm going to, going to put a sort of like a gazebo type structure in the middle of the courtyard. And the idea behind that was to create an outdoor space that felt like a public town square that you would have out in the real world, but it's in the homeless shelter and it would allow the residents there, the homeless people, folks staying there, to occupy what would feel like a public space, but in a dignified way. And also because we have this gazebo structure and the way everything else was designed about the outdoor space, we could use that area for fundraising and events. So you could host things there. It becomes a bandstand. You can have music there. You can have strong lights. You can have all of these things taking place. And so that's a brief example of, again, like... It, one of the mistakes that you would want to avoid as an architect is to look at a list of program and allow your preconceptions of what outdoor space means and just go with that. Yeah. Oh, outdoor space. Yeah. So we have some grass. Good enough. Well, maybe there's a way we can leverage outdoor space to do multiple things that's impactful for the users, the occupants, and also for, in that case, like you know, fundraising and other events. The same thinking applies when we get to a house. Is there a way that we can make this thing be more than just again, the absolute most lowest common denominator yeah. uh, solution, which oftentimes is not a real solution, just lazy, lazy thinking. I think something that people might be thinking, you know, with being so specific to the user is that, well, okay, but what is my, how does that impact the resale value of my home? Because what we, you know, as we discussed earlier on, something that works for like 
a specific office, for example, might not work for the next one that will mm -hmm. use that space. And the same goes with a house. Like if you design it specifically for this client who does pottery, the next person who's going to buy the house might not be doing pottery. Therefore, are you taking value out of the property by doing that or, or not? Um, I think, again, if... If that is a concern and if you know that you're going to sell your house in 15 years because you want to retire in the south of France, then thinking about how can that space be transformed then to accommodate, in this case, like a, a specific market mm -hmm. of buyers, that's a legitimate concern to have. And I think if, if you're smart enough in designing a house, you can make it happen easily enough that... You know, they could try and sell it with the pottery studio or they could turn it back into a home office or something else. And then the concern is lifted. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, my, my first response is that it, it really depends on how long you plan on living there. Yeah. If it's a long term home, I think too many people worry about like this market, which will change dramatically in the places that we practice most often in 10 years anyway. And I think too many people. They worry too much about that in the sense that they end up living in something that's not actually fit for them. And it's just a, a waste. Like, don't do that. Just to, If you have the finances, if you're fortunate enough to have the finances, you've worked hard to have the money to create something that you're going to live in and experience and just make it what it should be for you. So that's my first position. Well, but, that, but I think also it, it also <laughs> ultimately contributes to the properties on the market to be extremely vanilla and soulless hmm. and I can't imagine that a lot of people are excited to buy any of these homes because they're not unique. They're not interesting. And I think if you have one space, that's amazing, even if it's used for something else. Like, it's just it just makes the house more special. Yeah. Um, I do like your, your idea and your proposal of the just there's ways to do small modifications to make it fit that eventual uh, desirable market uh, outcome. Yeah. Um, and that's something we've done before. We think, and we've, we, yeah, we've done before. And it's not difficult. I mean, you do want to be mindful, like some certain construction tasks are more expensive and take more time, and others take less time and money. So if we can create a, a house that has spaces that are very unique, but they can be easily converted into another bedroom or just staged that way, then that's good enough yeah. and whatever amount of money it will cost to make that conversion of putting up a few studs and some drywall on a door will be worth having uh you know 10 years of a house that you love and enjoy for like absolutely i was also trying to think of examples of more inventive program um that takes place in larger scale projects or projects that aren't houses yeah, I was thinking about that too. I think there is one for me that stands out uh, quite a bit, and that's a project I've done with two of my school friends. It was a group project. The site was pretty incredible. It was um, uh, sand dunes along the, the, the central coast of California, mm -hmm. and it's actually, I think, a, a historical site or a protected site, right? Mm -hmm. So the brief was like, build the shelter or something for people visiting this area, in a way that kind of like preserves the site, mm -hmm. but also engages with it. And the interesting thing, the interesting thing that we did is that um, instead of just starting with like, okay, well, we need a place for them to sleep, a place for them to eat, and a place for them to shower, we're like, well, let's let's go and kind of experiment and and get a feeling for what the site is like. Mm -hmm. So we actually spend the whole day on the sand, on the dunes, like running around and doing like photography experiment, playing with the wind and doing like a series of photos. We collected, you know, objects and things that we found <gasps> on the dunes. Stealing from the dunes. Which I don't think we were supposed to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like pieces yeah. of wood that have been like worn because of the wind and the sand and had some, you know, certain textures and colors, right? Um, and just kind of understand... It, it, it's interesting because to me, like there is the, the human program that comes with a project. Like mm -hmm. what does the occupant needs and wants and then there is like what is the site or the house we're remodeling needs and wants because i think that's also any property comes with its own embodied program um mm. you know that i think is sometimes overlooked mm -hmm. or or dismissed and it, it's it's often where you found like the most unique and the most the most basic sometimes, but the most unique and the most um, natural 
um, kind of DNA that you want the project to be. Yeah. Um, so that was very important for us to kind of like go spend the day there and understand like what does the building wants to be. And our response to this brief was that we wanted the building to change and evolve as the wind and the level of the sand was changing throughout the day. Mm. So it was not for us to just plop a structure and have it being forced onto the site, but rather have it have the grade around the building to change. So maybe sometimes you're going to have to climb up to the platform mm -hmm. of the building. Mm -hmm. You know, you won't have a landing and a stair and a railing, mm -hmm. which we completely ignore the code question to really like dive into that. And some other times the building is going to get buried under the sand and you probably won't be able to spend a night there. Mm -hmm. But kind of like giving the room of the elements to take over the building as they needed to. Um, and then for the experience of, of people who were staying there overnight for like a night or two, really kind of like make them um, very aware of anything they needed to do while they were staying on the site. So um, I think we had like uh, open air showers uh, that were enclosed for like, you know, privacy reasons, but like there's no opening in that box, but just the sky. So you, when you're showering, like the water comes from above and you have to look up to connect with, with the sky. We had a room where you would uh, sleep in your sleeping bag because, you know, it was, it was not meant to be a luxury hotel. Like you come and you're, you're kind of camping there, right? Mm. You're, you're becoming one with the site and you could look at the stars, but you're inside. Another space that was more about um, kind of observing the, the level of the sand changing throughout the day. So you had basically a piece of glass against the sand level. So mm -hmm. you can kind of see like the lives that happen. You know, like if you think about it, it just reminds me of like kids and kids experiment. The way you look at things as a kid, you're very curious and you want to learn and you want to like, you know, you just want to try stuff out. And if we could create that with a building for more of an adult level mm -hmm. of, of playground. Um, and that was a that was a very beautiful project. I think that was one of my favorite project because it really questioned like, what does a shelter needs to be? Mm. Uh, what does it mean to have a shelter on this specific location rather than elsewhere? And And again, like, how do you make a building appropriate for where it is? Uh, and and how could that never be replicated anywhere else? So th it's an interesting thing is that, uh, one, it sounds like a very poetic project, but how much of what you described was described in the original project brief, which contained the program requirements? What's the question? Yeah. I mean, we met, you know, like the requirements of you need a place to sleep, you need a place to shower, right? But everything else was not in the brief. Yeah. It was kind of our interpretation of the brief of the brief by us understanding what the space and what the brief was should be calling for. Yes, um, yes. Which yes. is, I think, you know, on the side note, something that students sometimes get a little bit too hung upon is that they just follow that checklist. Yep, I agree. And they, they're being too prescriptive. Yeah. They're, they're being too prescriptive. There is ma Again, there is many ways to create a movie. There is many ways to create a building and you can still check the boxes, but go, f but come from a completely different perspective than anyone could anticipate. I think that's one of the challenges and interesting things about what we do is that it is very easy for someone to look at a long program list, especially when the program list gets long and there's a lot of requirements to look at that 100 you know, a line item list and just be like, I got to fit all this stuff in here. And this room has to be 15 by 15. That one's 20 by 20 box, 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 box. Okay. It's, it all fits good. Now, what does it look like? Well, just make it all white and modern. Like I was saying before. Yeah. And that's like not, that doesn't produce anything in the, in the end. And, and the floor plan of that project actually was pretty interesting because there's basically two plane floating above each other, like a ground and a roof, right? With spaces, like you could say, like not boxes, but kind of enclosed spaces that were punctuating that plane. Mm -hmm. So everything was outside. Like once you went from like one space to the other, you were outside in the elements. You were not into like a hallway or like an indoor conditioned space. Like you... Again, it was really to engage, you know, uh, people in how they used it. Yeah, you know, I, I do have to say one of my my criticisms of of a lot of the houses that are designed, even by reputable architects, is that they don't really get as conceptual as what you're describing, and they don't they aren't as poetic. They don't in, again interrogate and question the program. It's more like okay, again, we have a living room, generic living room, and let's just execute it really nicely. But it's not often that the boundaries are 
Yeah. Pushed. I think it comes from different things. I think it comes from the client being adventurous or not. True. You know, people like comfort, and yeah. they and if they are comfortable, they necessarily don't question things as much. And it also comes from like building code requirements, which is which is the prescriptive list that we have to deal with, yeah. you know, and and that limits. You have to be extremely creative to check that list, and still like do something, you know, kind of interesting. But it's an odd thing too, because uh, in a way, houses are the the are the easiest in terms of code. Com- well, it's, it's, it's hard to say that, but houses tend to have more flexibility. Than other program types. Yeah, as you were describing your project, I was trying to think of 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 another one. There, there's one project we did that was again a it was a competition conceptual thing, uh, so not built. And it was to the project brief was a little, was worded in a kind of academic kind of clever way, but broadly speaking, it was to design a community center for this this uh, city or town in in Brooklyn. The neighborhood was called Gowanus. And in Go- <laughs> it's a great name. In Gowanus, there's this body of water. It's a canal, which I think is the most polluted canal in like in the history of the United States. If you look at polluted bodies of water across the world, it's like number three. Something insane. There's like cancerous things that are growing in there. I mean, it's outrageous. There's a mythology behind it at this point because it's so gross and it's a super fun site. All this stuff, right? And one of the program requirements of this call it community center was to have classrooms and the general goal of the community center was to provide functional spaces that the the, the community needed but also kind of like raise awareness about the the canal which is at the heart of of uh, the neighborhood it's also an interesting thing when you have a canal at the heart of a neighborhood and it's that polluted because you're it it bifurcates the neighborhood in half well and you kind of want to stay away more than engage with it too exactly But it, it it is, I believe it still is a super fun site, so it is going to be cleaned up. So we had this idea, this proposal of why don't we have – so during that brief and also our analysis, and this is in, in New York City, right? It's interesting with New York City because all the neighborhoods, for the most part, have a very important public space to them. Um, mass, uh, I'm referring my names now. Uh, Central Park, uh, Wa- uh, Washington Square, down in in was it West Village area? Like neighbor neighborhood, there's some kind of park slope. There's some important public space for people to gather and whatever. A plaza else. or park usually. Yeah. We recognized that Gowanus didn't have that. What they had was this body of water. <laughs> and this thing gro- that nobody wanted. <laughs> and it's gross. It's going to be clean, but then it's clean. So then then what? Right. And so part of our proposal was why don't we have um, floating chunks of park, like little pocket parks that would float on the water that you could occupy, and they would move up and down the water. And that did, that did a few things. One, spatially, it allowed people to actually occupy the center and the most important part of Gowanus and its history, which was the canal. It allowed you to, to, to traverse up and down the canal and see all these things that are happening on both sides. And in that case, there's a lot of kind of like makers, in mm-hmm. fact, people making stuff. And so spatially, that's very interesting, right? It also allows you then to use those little pocket parks as outdoor classrooms to talk about the history of the canal whilst you're on the canal. And it allows the parks to merge up to make a, a larger park. And that as an idea, one, obviously, like the feasibility, there's, there's, there's challenges with that. It could easily be done, but there's challenges. But who would think about if you have a program list, you, we need classrooms, Okay, we'll see. Classroom is usually about 15 by 15. Maybe there's like 30 desks. Yeah. There's some kind of whiteboard, a smart whiteboard in the front, and some windows because we want natural daylight. That's your generic classroom. But when you when you interrogate and you question the preconception of classroom and you factor in the understanding of the site, as like you were saying, then it starts to be really interesting, right? And you factor in the the, the spatial problems that Gowanus has and the lack of a part. Like all these things get solved through one gesture I, I think it comes like the success of a, any project this one or, or even just the whole brain model i think is like how do you engage all of those different uh, protagonists you know mm. the the body of water the park itself the city the, the kids that are learning like because i think it's that engagement between spaces building and people and use that really um that really makes things change. Like you're, you're now creating an actual dialogue between all of these components rather than just having them sit passively next to each other. Yeah. So I think that in conclusion, 
program, despite it often having this this kind of taste of being generic and boring, it's not. It's not if you do it well, right? It's the same thing when we're starting any project. The research that's done of the site, of the culture, of the users, and all that stuff could sound boring. Like, oh, yeah, researching the constraints that I have to meet, the things I have to deal with. No, it's the opposite. These are yeah. the things that are going to be the most interesting. Yeah, and I think it's um, it's funny because it's probably one of the easiest tool design tool available on a project you know like you know detailing mill work yeah fine i mean you can spend hours doing that <laughs> that's exciting but really the program is the most accessible design tool for anybody even if you're not a good designer even if you know your aesthetic and your choices aren't that great like if you're really good at nailing down that program mm -hmm. and creating from that i think you could you could hit the jackpot and that's also that reminds me that, um, again, earlier I said it's the foundation of good design. And it is because if you have an accurate program list and a deep understanding and a create and you're loose in your thinking and you're creative with it, you've laid the infrastructure for something really interesting, right? Even if in the end that we we would look at it and say, I disagree with how you match the materials, like the bones are there, mm -hmm. right? Conversely, if you don't have those that program figured out and you get to the very end and you have the finest materials and the best details, that does not matter. The building will not be a success if the program is not worked out and the site planning of the program is not worked out. And I think we see that a lot, you know, with uh, particularly like remodel projects, you mm. know, like if a house has been thought out really well from the program standpoint, then it's just of like a matter of outdated finishes. True. Right. And True. like outdated siding, outdated, like, you know, roofing that's been worn, worn out and, and stuff like that. If it hasn't, then you need to move functions around. You need to move windows. You need to move walls. You need to change the eave slopes. Like, yeah. you know, that's that's a bigger deal. So, yeah, I think good planning and programming and designing from that would lead to a, a successful architecture that would last much longer than one that, that doesn't. Agreed. All right. I think that's a good conclusion. So if you enjoy this conversation and you want to support us, then you can review and rate the show. You can find it on Spotify, YouTube, and the Apple Podcast app, and pretty much all other podcast platforms. You can find our office, which is Fame Architecture and Design, on, online. We're everywhere. Um, the podcast has a website as well, which is secondstudiopod.com, and an Instagram, and we have uh, about 80,000 followers on there, so a decent following, and uh, it's a good place for to engage in dialogue at a time. So if you feel like talking about something, then just go on there and leave your thoughts, and someone will reply. Might not be us, but someone's yeah, reply. someone will. <laughs> uh, we also have the hotline two one three two 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 six nine five zero. You can send us a text message. You can call and leave a voicemail if you have any questions still about what a program is, or if you have any other topics that you would want us to talk about. You can send out your suggestions that way. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot more coming up, so please subscribe, stay tuned, follow us, share along if you feel like these types of recordings could be helpful to anyone you know. Uh, I mean, our goal is really to help people as much as we can. Um, students, clients, architects, anybody. Yep. Awesome. Sounds good. Bye. Bye-bye.